So um, welcome everyone. We will be starting right now. Um, so we are in a treat for the event which is called Surviving Cyber COVID-19. And our speaker of tonight is Ian. And I believe we are in a really good treat because the presentation looks really interesting and he has a lot of experience which he will discuss with us. So before we do move over there, we will not have too much of the housekeeping, but what I would like you guys to have a look in your free time, please do check at the BCF org about the vital workers. So um, it's our campaign uh, which is highlighting and recognizing and celebrating all the contributions that IT professionals are, make, are making in these unprecedented times. So if you have some spare time, please do so. We also would like to encourage you if you are not uh, current BCS members, because we do understand that a lot of people can join because it's a free event, it's for the society. So if you would like to join us, please do make sure that you are visiting bcs.org.join and you join BCS as our member. There are a lot of benefits. You can read all around that and we like to ma make the society good. And before I move and pass over the word to Ian, I would like just to uh, inform you that we do plan um, another event in the month time. So it will be 9th of the June and the topic will be the key risk and control consideration when migrating to public cloud. So please watch out for the link once it is published. We would really like you to join us on the next event. And on that note, um, I'm passing on um, the sharing of the screen to Ian and he will take you through the through his presentation and through his slides. So thank you so much, Ian, for being with us tonight. It's such an honor to have you. And I uh, hope that you will enjoy it as well as we do. Absolutely, I'm all fired up. And thank you so much for the kind introduction and a shout out to all of the members and non-members that joined us tonight. Truly appreciate it. So um, a couple of things about me. Um, this presentation will be in light mode, but I always want to put a dark mode uh, slide into the deck. Um, these are some of the things that I've been involved in. I've, I've been a part of the information security community since DEF CON 9. Uh, unfortunately, DEF CON really is canceled this year. Uh, very, very sad. So be extra kind to your information security people because usually they spend a week in Las Vegas, Nevada, attending Black Hat, DEF CON, Diana Initiative, and B-Sides Las Vegas, um, and to blow off steam. And unfortunately this year, that's not gonna happen, but uh, DEF CON is gonna go virtual this year. So that's pretty exciting and kind of, what has happened to the entire IT and information security uh, community is uh, virtual events. So, you know, obviously the networking drinks bill is considerably less than it usually is, but um, we're gonna have a lot of fun anyways. Very active on Twitter, um, at fat underscore hobbit is my handle. I push out a lot of content um, around security, do a lot of commentary in Forbes and have written articles for Tripwire and commentary for SE Magazine and Hack Read as well. I, like I said, I've been part of the community for a long time. That's my scary mode picture and we're gonna go to my corporate one. There we go. So. Um, Highlights about me, I uh, spent 12 years in the Canadian Forces uh, as a military police officer, uh, then uh, made a transition to public affairs. Um, and I spent one year with the Royal Canadian Mounted Police uh, working in uh, Division D criminal analysis. And um, so, yeah, almost like a criminal profiler, but for cyber criminal douchebags. And um, I, again, I comment a lot on, on items of interest, as in just today, there was a bunch of uh, sad news uh, that people don't understand what Google Firebase is. They used it in a bunch of Androids, and oopsie, all of their data was not secured. This is happening more and more. Um, sadly, the, the digital transformation didn't seem to include a lot of security training. And as a result, we have some pretty disastrous uh, situations that we're gonna get into. And I woke up one morning and I became a CISO. Um, I've worked for large financial uh, corporations. I work for small startups. And right now I'm with Sijax as their CISO, uh, which is really a threat intelligence startup. So I'm pretty, pretty excited about that new stage of my career. And of course, uh, no presentation I can do 
can't go without mentioning my involvement with the beer farmers, a virtual InfoSec band, uh, myself and four other members. Uh, we are there to try and uplift the profession, uh, give people an opportunity to vent their frustrations, and really support the information security community by conducting online events like our um, legendary uh, BeerCon 1, which was a 24-hour, 72-guest uh, extravaganza that we did uh, last year in December of uh, 2019. So, so now question, I need to stop yeah. you here because you know, we are all predominantly and all the attendees are IT people. Where awesome. can we get involved with the beer farmers and have a drink with you, you know? Is there anywhere like, <laughs> you know, I have sure. to ask, I have to ask because regardless of that, just for all the attendees, we do have the possibility of the chat. So if you wanna give us some some thoughts or uh, or stuff like that, please utilize on the go to webinar the chat functions. If you want some questions, I didn't probably say before you went all the storming of, about the DEF CON and you know, being in Las Vegas, I really miss it. And I am sad and I need to went as you are. <laughs> Um, so I just uh, I just want to say if you want to have some questions in the end, um, Ian will be taking questions. You can put them on there as he speak. I will be managing it with you guys, and then I will be in the end taking the questions with him. Uh, give you the availability also to speak up if you want to. I will unmute your your microphone, but we will do that in the end of the event because as you can hear, Ian is very passionate, and we are in the treat for the great presentation. I think we all will have fun. So coming back to the questions about the beer farmers, sorry, yeah. I had to. No, that's that's wonderful. So we are regular guests on a uh, podcast slash event on Discord called The Many Hat Club. Uh, Cyberstech Stu uh, is the founder of The Many Hats Club and we are frequently his guests and we appear on that show. Our next show is this Thursday night. Um, and we're really excited. Uh, unfortunately, our ability to consume alcoholic beverages is somewhat curtailed because now we have to do it in the privacy of our own home, but uh, you can certainly join us online and uh, Discord and uh, it's such a really cool format where it's Q&A, it's interactive, it's, it's really exciting. So please uh, check out the Many Hats Club and you'll find the beer farmers lurking. So, um, I love Multigo, but no organization really cares. But they do, and this is the interesting thing. So what you're looking at here was an article I wrote uh, a while back. Um, this was in PC World, um, and this was about hunting down an advanced persistent threat group that I called Magdalena Sonora, uh, based after the domain that they were uh, that they were using. And what you're seeing here is what cyber threat intelligence looks like in that the giant hairball is the domains the infrastructure and all of the even the emails of people that were involved in the registering of all these fraudulent domains that were involved in attacking a doctor's office client of mine and this is really interesting to me because this happened before COVID-19. This was a targeted attack on the institution where they were literally pretending to be doctors, providing test results, and those test results linked to servers that were trying to intercept their Office 365 user IDs and passwords, right, to gain access to patient records quite possibly to sell uh, later on uh, in the cyber criminal underground. So this is a real hands-on exercise for me. It was taking a lot of what I did in the uh, mounted police in building these charts to really understand all of the intricacies of how the cyber criminals operate. And what's interesting is, is these folks spent so much time and effort in creating the infrastructure, registering domains, getting certificates for those domains issued, conducting very stealthy attacks in that they would only send one or two specifically targeted phishing emails in hopes of a payoff. So 
really kind of next level stuff. And that's why I was able to sort of claim that they're an advanced persistent threat group. And I worked with a wonderful guy by the name of Brian from Kaspersky. Give him a huge shout out. He's with the Kaspersky uh, threat analysis team who do some of the best uh, threat analysis in the world. And, you know, he helped me kind of see the bigger picture of this organization when I was just starting out a couple years ago in chasing down infrastructure. So before we begin, uh, we need to have a conversation, and this is sort of a pet peeve of me. So words matter. We've seen a lot of the press, um, both mainstream and information security press, take the words hack, hackers, and hacking, and really put a negative connotation on it. Uh, you know, you know, we say things like that law firm was hacked um, and stuff like that. And to be honest, as a former hacker on the good side, as a white hat person, as a person that tracks down cyber criminals and monitors their activity for a living, kind of take a little ombrage to that. And I just put on this slide a whole bunch of different things that hacker and hackings and hacking really means. You know, it can be everything from jury rigging something to making it work to, uh, you know, a negative um, charlatan to tear something apart to come up with an out of the box solution. So I just kind of like to see it as the way uh, Marcus J. Carey sees it in his amazing book, Tribe of Hackers, that really talks about how information security is really not about the right or wrong aspect. That defines you as whether or not you're a malicious actor or a cybersecurity researcher. And just today in Wired, uh, the amazing story of Marcus Higgins, aka Malwaretech, aka the guy that stopped WannaCry, his story came out and he had dabbled on the dark side, but ultimately his story is about the redemption of a cyber criminal who admitted his mistakes and took those amazing skill set that he had developed since he was 15 years old and applied it uh, in such a way that you know he saved us from a major cyber attack um, by finding the kill switch to the WannaCry uh, virus. So controversial figure, I will admit, um, the reality is, is that in order to understand how a bad guy attacks, some bad guy experience is kind of necessary. And that experience can be virtual, as in, you know, great certifications like OASP and other pen testing, uh, red teaming uh, courses that you can get, or it can be unfortunately found in the cyber criminal careers of folks like Mr. McKinnon and, of course, the infamous Lori Love. So, uh, a little bit about Sidejax. Um, we do cyber threat intelligence. We're primarily in the enterprise space. Um, we really do a lot of stuff around data aggregation. And in this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about data aggregation and what it exactly means and how kind of CTI works and how we've been leveraging this to sort of survive the cyber criminal onslaught that we've seen. Just today, um, it, uh, a, there was uh, a 30 percent uh, increase in the amount of cyber attacks impacting UK business. That article came out in IT Pro today. Not surprising. Pretty much every cyber criminal group has been using COVID-19. Uh, and I wrote a really tongue-in-cheek um, uh, pretend stolen document for a from a cyber crime uh, a collective gathering that indicated that COVID-19 scams had really managed to occupy uh, law enforcement and um, law enforcement has been going after, you know, fake testing kits, fake promises of PPE, uh, substandard um, uh, uh, testing, et cetera, et cetera. And it's really taken the focus off the more, I'm going to say, substantial cyber criminal activity that we've been seeing online 
Um, and specifically, what we're seeing is the monetization of a hacked PC. And this is a great slide that Brian Krebs put together back in 2012. Um, I highly recommend following Brian on either Twitter or making sure that you visit his blog uh, and subscribe to his blog because uh, if you're really interested in the nastiness and the seedy underbelly of cybercrime, that is where you get the best stories, right? That and of course my stories, but Brian, really great guy. Um, if you look at where we are right now, a lot of this stuff comes into vogue, goes away. Right now we're into a cycle where our financial credentials to bank accounts, um, things like that have been really, uh, and, and hostage attacks have been really the ones to focus on that have been really bountiful. But crime and cybercrime in general has been a huge growth industry. And some of the numbers are truly horrifying. You know, we're talking about trillions of dollars in losses when you look at the whole cybercrime ecosystem, right? And that's not just about like the, the technical hacking stuff. When you look at um, most of the data coming out of the United States, because they seem to be tracking it the best at a nation state level, when you look at the reports from IC3, the biggest hack out there right now is business email compromise. That's where I pretend to be an important executive in your company. I find somebody that's like newly started their job and I throw around my title and I develop a sense of urgency to get them to transfer a bunch of money or to go out and buy gift cards and read me the numbers and everything like this. And, and sadly, thousands of people are falling for these scams every day, right? The other really big one, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, just thinking about that because I think that could be a really good thing to elaborate a little bit more because we are talking about COVID. We are working from home, and as you mm -hmm. said, it's if you're in the in the office, you generally have the possibility to ask somebody else, like, "Hey, do you know this, or shall I do that?" But if you are in yeah. the isolation at home, I think it's playing more to the social engineering and all the aspects of those phishing and uh, those activities targeting people at home. Do you have any like uh, maybe your working experience? Have you have you noticed that or discussed with your CISO? Like, is it an increase? Do you have any intel, like how actually the, the bad guys are using the COVID and the fact that people work from home as, let's say, for their advantage? Can you elaborate a little bit more on that, please? Absolutely. So we have uh, released a, uh, a cybercrime report specifically on the variety of different COVID-19 uh, scams. And we are certainly seeing people in medical, uh, in the medical vertical, as well as all of the uh, supply chain for medical, being victimized by business email compromise attacks in a number of different ways. This can be onboarding of fake employees. This can be trying to change the banking information. This can be sending fraudulent invoices from similarly named companies into the processing system. And you're 100% right in that because we're working in isolation, sometimes it's difficult, uh, even with chat and even with Zoom and stuff like that, to really coordinate the effort. And there's such a sense of urgency right now to, um, to supply these critical things like PPE. We've seen a number of scams that are like, I need 50,000 uh, pounds transferred to this bank account in order to secure this order and I need it within hours and some of it is legit because this is in huge supply demand others it's cyber criminals coming in on those coattails so we're seeing a lot of organizations um, issue their executives and the purchase uh, order people or the people that are commanding those departments with authorization codes and even in some cases one-time codes in order to authorize transactions. Um, banks are looking at a lot of data on these money transfers and their anti-fraud algorithms. Some, some banks are way ahead of the curve on detecting fraudulent activity. Shout out to Monzo for that. Um, they actually knew about the Ticketmaster data breach before Ticketmaster knew that they had a data breach because their fraud algorithms are that good. Um, really, really interesting stuff 
but we absolutely are seeing a wide variety of different social engineering attacks, getting that sense of urgency. Let's also not forget that the people that are trying to keep the cupboards full of PPE, for instance, are stressed, they're overworked, they need to get this done. I'm telling you, it's really easy when you have a person in that kind of mental state to have them make a mistake. So 100%, you are right on the money with your uh, with your hypothesis there that it's it's far more dangerous than it ever was before. So and is there anything? Yeah. If there would be just one thing before you continue, one thing which you would recommend the attendees and you know people around what to do? Like you 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 mentioned that some people are stressed, they are isolated, they are overburned. You know, some people can be in 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 a lethargy just because they feel all that pandemic is going up on them. If there is one thing which you would recommend those people how to be more secure, what that would be? Yeah, it, certainly it's got to be that um, get authorization from senior management for that kind of transaction. Google to see if the company has a legit website. You know, do a little bit of quick investigation. And if anything, if the smell test is wrong, right? Um, like if they want to be paid in Bitcoin, that would, <laughs> that would be one. But I'm just saying, do a little bit of Google research, run the email address telephone the business, um, get a telephone number if there isn't. So do just a little bit of due diligence, five minutes of Googling and, and going to company's house, for instance, and running the company name and it not appearing, but they say they have a UK office, you know that's probably gonna be a red flag right there, right? Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you so much. So. On my next slide, I just want to talk a little bit about the crazy sort of cyber crime and how it adapts to the situations. We have a plethora of, of great documents called indictments for criminals that have been involved in cyber crime going right back almost to the history to the early beginnings. So right here we see a crew that was breaking into uh, public branch exchanges, so the old type of telephone system before voice over IP became the big thing, they would break in, they would change people's mailboxes to I accept the charges, and then through the immigrant community, because at the time long distance was a very expensive thing, through the immigrant community they would circulate these numbers that would be a third party billing number, and they racked up uh, hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in profit, right? Well, obviously Skype now and FaceTime and all these other um, electronic and internet-based stuff, obviously that's no longer that much of a scam, although there have been occasional reports that surface of compromised mailboxes being used, what's called in a direct inward dial fashion in order to rack up charges on those pay per minute uh, charges, uh, telephone numbers that the cyber criminals had actually set up. So this is how they have adapted over time from the arrival of sort of wide scale communications technology. There is still an element and a crew and several crews that attempt to get access to voice over IP infrastructure and then leverage that for, for, for cyber attacks. Also really interesting is this indictment going way back to 2010. This was before there was ransomware. What this was, was an actual ad that would appear on your computer that would socially engineer you into thinking that your computer had a virus on it. And these folks made millions and millions of dollars. They paved the way for an actual virus on your computer that then demanded a ransom. And these folks worked um, in fake tech support and this scam had been going on for a really long time. So none of this is new, but in COVID, all of this stuff has now come home to roost, okay? And what's interesting is every time there is a government announcement of a program, the cyber criminals are actually ahead of the game, registering fake websites, sending out text message and, and smishing messages to, to phones, trying to convince people to sign up for government programs that 
legitimately exist, but the government wasn't even ready. A good example is the Sea Bills program that wasn't actually ready to accept anyone and you had to work through an approved financial institution. Well, the cyber criminals had websites set up all there to gather all of your personal information, all of your sensitive information, including your banking information for the deposit that was never going to come. And just to put a little bit of a more pertinent spin on it, do you folks remember when the president of the United States sat up and he mentioned a drug called methylchloroquine? Methylchloroquine was looked at as perhaps being a, a, a drug that would reduce the symptoms of COVID, possibly cure it. Within four hours, we had fake drug, order your methylchloroquine uh, chloroquine drug set up and running. That's how fast the cyber criminals are moving. That's how fast this um, whole COVID pandemic has been exploited. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some good news, okay? Because despite your opinions of the United States and what they're doing, the United States has essentially become the world police force, okay? Now, this is the kind of thing that you need to know about the United States, that in cases where there has been not always, but in most cases, I'm going to say 99% of the cases I'm looked at, there has to be one out of the N number of victims, okay, American or American company. If that's the case, the Americans are prepared to charge you under American law, regardless if you're an American citizen or not, okay? So what we have here is four very interesting indictments. Jamaican citizens, their crime, selling fake lottery uh, to people in Florida. Okay, so they targeted folks with a fake lottery. Now, what's interesting is you see the fake lottery scam happen when obviously you have mass unemployment. So this one is on the rise again, right? Because people want to think, oh, well, you know, maybe it's worth a, a 10 or $50 chance at a hundred thousand or more as a payoff, right? That the, the there was no lottery here. There was a pretend lottery that never paid out a dime. But people made hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars off of this kind of scam. The next one, okay? Indian citizens, no Americans, fake call center. We've all had those calls where um, they 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 pretend that you have an immigration problem a tax problem. It got so bad that Canada actually sent a Mountie, one Mountie, to India to help arrest a whole bunch of people. It's pretty serious when Canada sends somebody um, over there. And I will tell you, as an ex-RCMP member, trying to get any travel approved outside of Canada is a freaking nightmare. So this was a really serious thing. Sadly, we're seeing this scam really hasn't gone away. There's kind of another scam that involves um, a, a phone call that suggests that you've been in a car accident. Um, we That one I got quite a bit, which is funny because I, I don't own a car uh, nor have a EU UK driver's license. So if I'm in an accident, I'm in deep dr trouble, not, you know, not trying to claim fake um, injury. A couple of other ones that are really interesting that get into a very murky relationship between American law enforcement, allies, okay, of the Americans, and a desire to enforce American law globally. So our first guy is a guy by the name of Trim, and he uh, is sitting in a Polish prison right now, uh, languishing there because obviously um, things are shut down, but he was up for extradition. What was his crime? Well, in the Ukraine, he ran a site called Kickass Torrents, which was arguably one of the largest uh, uh, intellectual property stolen content repositories, right, of all sorts of torrented movies. Well, he got arrested when he was on his way to holiday uh, when a plane landed in Poland, and he's sitting there. Um, be under indictment uh, for things like um, criminal copyright. Well, as Ukraine, not sure if there's a copyright in the Ukraine. 
Um, certainly there is in the United States. It's called the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And he unfortunately found out that they're prepared uh, to enforce that globally. As is a guy that we don't hear from that much anymore, Kim.com, New Zealand citizen, also brought to heel. You can see in his actual indictment there, conspiracy to commit racketeering and conspiracy to commit copyright infringement. 18 USC code 371. Interesting that USC code 18 USC is what they call an extrajudicial territorial statute, which means America will come after you no matter where you are. So, so we just got scared right now, yeah. <laughs> well, if you're a bad guy, that's probably good. The problem is, is getting at them when they're in countries that are, shall we say, not on a cooperative um, uh, level with the United States. And that's one but of the you... realities. That's why we have the havens that we do in places like Russia, Eastern Europe, some Asian countries, uh, such as North Korea, Iran, um, and a few up-and-comers as well. So. You know, it, but do you it, think? Hmm? Sorry to interrupt you, but yeah, how no, I'm just no. receiving that? And please, guys, if if you wanna join us in in the chat or in the questions related to that, because U.S. has such a strong, um, let's say, enforcement and legal setup, why do you think it's it's not a similar in the Europe or European Union or Britain itself? Because we are on on the British islands. Like, why do you think such let's say enforcement options aren't embedded in our let's say legal system and stuff like that? Because it's that really would help, good, right? It's a really good question. So there's a couple of factors. One is the gigantic amount of money that the United States has decided to spend on security and the justice system. It's an order of magnitude higher than the GDP of some European countries. They are literally spending more money than the GDP of some European countries. The other thing is, is that the uh, American judicial system is very one-sided when it comes to non-American citizens. Okay, what do I mean by that? Okay, so in the US, if you're a US citizen, and if you're a US citizen outside the US, you have access to the US Constitution to protect you from things like excessive search and seizure, okay? You don't. As a non-American citizen, you do not have the protections of the US Constitution. What does that mean? It means that the test for deciding of whether or not you're a bad guy is not nearly as robust as if you were an American citizen. So even though you're being held accountable to American law, you are you do not receive the protections of the American uh, legal uh, framework of the Constitution. So this sets up a very interesting paradigm. And what you will see is the Americans have the ability to obtain evidence that would normally be reserved for intelligence operatives and use it in criminal indictments against you. So in a lot of cases, and I am going to have one in this presentation, we'll see where the UK decided it was far easier to dispose of a cyber criminal by giving him to the Americans than it would be within their own legal framework. And the penalties for hacking in places like Europe and the UK are not nearly as I'm going to say, and in fact, I would say overly excessive in the case of the United States. Does that answer the question a bit? Yeah, absolutely. And we do have a pretty B asking that, um, we, uh, and I'm trying to understand the question. You can get a call saying that your broadband has been hacked by someone, blah, 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 blah in Mo someone in Mon Mountain View. So I'm guessing that it's related to Google, that yep. it can shut up like by a minute or something like that. So I'm just trying pretty to understand your question. So hopefully I transfer it a little bit, but it, the, the question is, can you help with that or something? So I don't, I don't really understand much of the questions, but I'm guessing the meaning behind that is like Google can shut down like those operation in, in, in a short minute, right? So that would be a support from them, right? For those it, things and activities. 
There's absolutely a worldwide effort going on led by Google and Microsoft and several teams from like Facebook and you know the big companies to take down cyber criminal infrastructure as fast as it is created. There are some companies that are very cooperative and there are other companies that aren't very cooperative, right? So um, yes, there's a lot of work being done on that at an international and global level. Um, and in fact, um, many companies came together uh, in the wake of the COVID crisis. The, in the UK, there's a cyber defense volunteer group headed up by Daniel Card and Lisa Forte. And in the United States, there's a group uh, called the Covert CTI League, absolute heroes, uh, led by Mark Rogers, who I work for at DEF CON in my capacity as a goon, um, as he is the uh, head of security for DEF CON. So there is a lot of um, worldwide effort right now um, going on to uh, try to dismantle the cyber criminal infrastructure almost as fast as it gets set up. Um, I just put Pretty on just to make sure that um, we can answer the question. So I just allowed Pretty to be on the on the microphone. So can you just elaborate your question? Ha, yeah. Ha, hello. Uh, thanks for allowing me to speak. I have been trying to get this thing sort of taken down. I've even reported it to Action Fraud. Uh, so the scam is similar to some of the others you just mentioned, but instead of saying that you're uh, you have an immigration problem or anything else, the scammer says that your broadband has been hacked and mm -hmm. then they ask you to type in my 1P address instead yep. of my IP address. And yep. if, you, if you type that out now in Google, it serves up a snippet, which is probably when Google um, draw, you know, found that page, which is a Google Mountain View IP address and some random information, which obviously the scammer can read. And because you've Googled that my 1P address, you can read that. So they then try to scare you to say that, um, you know, this, this particular IP address from Mountain View is trying to hack into your broadband or whatever. And, and they ask you to download Team Viewer app yeah. on, um, uh, which will, I, I believe, allow them access to your device. So obviously I'm not getting fooled, but I keep them talking as long as I can to the awesome. point where I think, <laughs> I think if they're talking to me, they're not trying to scam someone else. A hundred percent. That is awesome. So, I, I'm I've, so glad that you're doing that because they are purposely targeting people that are unaware or the elderly. Uh, you know, my mom is hit by the same scam a couple of times. She didn't fall for it. Um, she would give yeah. me the telephone number and I would um, put it out on my Twitter, um, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So that's awesome. Thank you so much. So what, I, you, what I meant to say was that if, if Google can just take that snippet down, that's one scam shut down. Yeah. Do, yeah. do you see what I mean? Just, just the snippet yeah. that serves. Because if you click on the link, it will show you your IP address, which is obviously something they can't read. But yeah. the, just the snippet that comes back is something Google should. I've 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 written to Google. I've written to Action Fraud. Obviously, they'll take their own time. So I don't know if you have more contacts than I do. <laughs> well, probably. I mean, what you can do is hit me up at ITT at .com and send me some details. Send me the site, and I'll take a look at it and see if I can pass it off to somebody. So, but that's awesome that you didn't fall for it. That is so great. Okay, so I already muted Pretty, so we just okay. uh, we do have uh, 20 minutes to go. So I think you have so right. much to cover. <laughs> yeah, we've got lots of stuff. So I'll I'll press on. So I really wanted to help people understand the kinds of actors, the kinds of attack, and the kinds of motivation that are going on. And it's pretty simple. Okay, we have ac affiliated actors, people that have inside threat, intimate knowledge of your environment. Right? We we call it you know disgruntled employees, stuff like that. We have unaffiliated actors, which are generally the majority of the type of cyber attack that you're going to face. Right? It's not going to be somebody that really knows you. We have types of attack. We have high visibility attacks that 
if their security controls in place are easy to detect, right? These are the kind of things where people are trying to brute force passwords or conduct password spray attacks. And then we have low visibility attacks, the covert attack, right? Persistent threat actors uh, tend to, type, to, to try to use these type of attacks. And then generally we have financially motivated attacks or geopolitically motivated attacks, right? And we can see some relationships um, around those type of things. So I'm just gonna go through you know, a couple of stories. I'm not gonna spend that much time on it. You're gonna get um, this deck anyways to read a little bit um, about this. But here's a really, an affiliated actor, high visibility attack, okay? This dude was really upset, right? When his boss got made part of a redundancy, all right? And nobody really checked into him, but he got really angry at the situation and he basically deleted 88 virtual servers, okay? Um, because he ended up, not only was his boss laid off, right? But then he was brought back in to be a contractor, okay? Maybe not the right idea, especially when you have somebody that's so angry at the company. Now, a lot of people talk about this attack that happened as being like, you know, an IT failure or whatever. And I would challenge you to suggest that in this type of thing, when you're dealing with affiliated actors, this is an HR and management problem and not an IT or an IT security problem. When you have people under stress, when you are doing redundancies and things like that, you need to make wise decisions that are in the favor of the employee. Now we are very lucky in the UK that if you're made redundant, you have your contracted obligation, you, you, you may have some sort of redundancy payment. Those of us working on contracts, you know, one month or three months, right? We have things like gardening leave, et cetera, et cetera. In the United States, it's generally at will, which means the boss can literally come in and say, I don't like the shoes that you're wearing today, goodbye. You're escorted out of the office. I had a colleague that was fired over email in, a, in working in an international company, fired in, in the United States over email, okay? That is abhorrent. And the HR people in my part of the company were like, absolutely couldn't believe that, right? It happens. But generally, affiliated actors are created by organizations by not following a, a general approach to the health and safety of their employees. And honestly, the easiest way to mitigate this type of attack is a cup of coffee when people are stressed and they're dealing with it. And so things like a virtual pub get together for your team, um, you know, calling somebody up, putting into the diary a check-in, these kind of things, super important and are easily the best response to insider threats. Now, we do have very stealthy, unaffiliated actors conducting low visibility attacks, and probably one of the most famous ones was the APT group known as CloudHopper, who essentially targeted IT services companies to break into them and then use all of the IT services companies' uh, infrastructure to take intellectual property from those customers. So under the guise of basically the relationship that that company had with those other companies, the actors mimicked the activities of that MSP or IT services provider to take um, information uh, and intellectual property out of those organizations. And this is kind of what it looked like. Um, APT10 was the threat group that we associate with this kind of style. This has now been emulated by many cyber criminals attacking IT service providers directly, attacking organizations that do service um, or provide infrastructure for other organizations. So this is a really kind of a new and very targeted attack and very difficult to detect if the provider of those services is not security aware and has not implemented a lot of security um, uh, uh, controls. The biggest one being 2FA 
or multi-factor authentication for users' IDs and passwords. And never, ever, ever, if you're in the IT services business, have a common password associated with all of your infrastructure. Many vendors have fallen victim to this when somebody has reversed engineered that account only to find that the password is, uni is not unique, it is common across the entire platform and many an organization has suffered mass infections as a result of that kind of mistake. So something to be very cautious about. Now, APT10 is a really interesting cyber criminal group. Uh, they, it is believed that they work for the China's Ministry of State Security, okay? They were responsible for this MSP campaign, but we have some information that is very interesting about them, that they've been around for quite some time, and it's quite possible that the whole um, uproar about Huawei dates back to when Huawei got a hold of some Cisco intellectual property, duplicated that, and then went to market essentially with counterfeit Cisco gear. So we're talking about an espionage campaign that victimized U.S. government agencies and companies and technology companies and stole intellectual property that made its way into the Huawei brand. So this may explain why there is this sense that um, Huawei has had this connection with the Chinese government and actually may not be conducting espionage today, but the, the roots of this giant company were actually as a result of cyber espionage of brands such as Northern Telecom in Canada or Nortel as we called it and Cisco as well. And so this is really, really interesting to me to see this global connection between the reluctance of America in sp specifically to do business with a company that was founded on the uh, stolen intellectual property of an American tech company. Very, another one kind of unaffiliated actor, high visibility attack. Sadly, this one is all too frequently what we see now. It's kind of interesting that this um, indictment goes way back into 2016 when we saw just yesterday the announcement of a major law firm that was hacked where all of this sensitive data, three quarters of a terabyte of data was exfiltrated before a ransomware attack was launched on the organization. Now this is another interesting attack but it wasn't conducted in the same way because the information that the actor was after, a guy by the name of Ayat Hong and his crew, was before market information to do a bunch of insider trading, okay? So this, this crew had a different approach. How did they break in? Brute force web access, uh, Outlook web access accounts, broke into partners' mailboxes, exfiltrated the entire email server, and then filtered through all of the emails looking for pre-market information. How were they found out? Because the crew ended up guessing too often and too correctly on the, um, uh, on the market movements that they ended up tripping an SEC trading um, algorithm and weren't actually caught for any of the break and enters that they did, the cyber break and enters that they did at this law firm. So we're seeing that law firms are a huge target right now. We're seeing that their security for that super confidential um, information is completely at risk. And actually we're seeing that going back to the 2015 hack of Mossack of FOCA, a, the Panama, where the Panama Papers originated from, the law firms are putting their entire firm and their livelihood at risk of having a poor approach to cybersecurity. I talked to you about the UK's reluctance sometimes to prosecute cyber criminals, and here we have a really great indictment of a dirtbag named Nathan Wyatt. Now, we can 
unequivocally call Nathan a dirtbag because he had several prior convictions for fraud before he turned to computer crime. Perhaps he got too fat to get off the couch, okay? And so rather than doing break and enter and petty theft, he turned to a life of cybercrime. Now, Nathan was not a bright guy, but he essentially decided to either join or affiliate himself with a pretty heavy duty cybercrime crew called the Dark Overlord. Now, the Dark Overlord was a crew that generally um, went after intellectual property. You may know them from such hacks of HBO and um, launching the season of Game of Thrones and making it publicly available before, trying to get a ransom. Well, Nathan upped his game and he targeted a member of the royal family. Pippa Middleton. Now, if there's one thing you don't do in the UK if you're a cyber criminal, is target a uh, royal because there is an entire kind of organization in Scotland Yard in the basement of Scotland Yard just waiting to pounce on anybody that messes with the royals. So what happened to Nathan? Well, it turns out that he was arrested for that. He had broken into Pippa Middleton's iTunes account, tried to exfiltrate a bunch of pictures and sell it to the media. Now, the media didn't want to have anything to do with this because they knew that the whole wrath of the royal family and the infinite amount of money that the royal family has to spend on lawyers would descend right down on their heads. So they were like, no, man, we don't want a piece of this. But the investigation turned up that it turns out our boy Nathan had targeted a couple of American businesses. So done and dusted, or as we like to see, easy peasy lemon squeezy. Nathan's on the plane to the United States to face those charges faster than you can say, what was the password to Pippa Middleton's account? So a couple things to understand. The profitability right now for the underground economy is absolutely massive. But there's one really interesting problem that they're having. They have too much data. The return on investment for getting data is actually growing smaller because that data already exists. The data exists so much so that remember the headlines about I'd say three weeks ago or so that talked about a data breach at the NHS, a data breach at the UK government? Not true. It was recycled data from a data breach many years prior to that. The cyber criminals have so much data on people right now that it is a rock bottom cost. It's like the price of oil, right? So what we're seeing though is the extraordinary return on investment where to set yourself up as a cyber criminal operation is a tiny minimal investment with absolutely gargantuan huge, pro, um, huge profits. So just a little kind of peek at what we do. We go through places that others fear to tread. We look at all sorts of the criminal marketplaces for our customers, uh, being alert for things that could impact our customers in places where that data is traded and sold and access to companies is traded and sold. This is really a huge important part of a cyber crime uh, or anti-cyber crime and anti-fraud and anti-money or money laundering program is to get access to these places on the internet. And there are numerous places with all sorts of different things for sale. It is absolutely crazy. Some of it, though, should be said, is police impersonating cyber criminals to find people that want to buy these things. So there is a certain element of reverse criminality going on to police this. I want to talk a little bit about cryptocurrencies because I think it's important to understand how they fit in to the actual cybercrime ecosystem. Cryptocurrencies, as you can imagine, are energy, if you can believe this. This is how you can describe what a cryptocurrency is because it takes money to provide power to create uh, the cryptocurrencies. And a lot of people think, you know, how can this thing have value? You know, how can you equate it? So what I like to do is educate people that cyber criminals want to steal this because not only does it have all of these aspects to it, it's fungible, it's divisible, it's acceptable, limited supply and all these great things, right? 
but it is actually a way of holding uh, energy in your hands or trading it virtually. And you can see that something that costs about 2.6 uh, thousand pounds to produce can be sold for 6.8 thousand pounds. You see now how criminals can leverage that and target and bypass, hijack, break into, use a work computer or steal a wallet full of Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Bitcoin is very desirable, especially by regimes like these guys. I'm just going to go to that slide quickly here. By regimes like North Korea and Iran, who are in, who are frequently under economic sanctions. And there you're seeing two indictments around crypto um, currency theft and cryptocurrency uh, mining that were perpetrated by actors in Iran and North Korea. Okay, one of the good news stories to share with you as we sort of wind down here is that the American Department of Justice has figured out how to trace Bitcoins from what was purchased through where those coins came from, the Bitcoin address that was used, the email account of the person, and identification of the bad guy. Okay, this these um, excerpts came from the Mueller indictment, where American investigators were able to discover all of the purchases for the infrastructure used in the 2016 election hacking and the uh, hacking of the DNC's uh, email server. Okay, and I want to send out a huge shout out to Paris, Josiah and Dalton who started off as a life of crime. They were the ones that invented the Myra botnet responsible for one of the largest uh, disruptive um, denial of service attacks that we have on record against dying DNS. But they were given the option by the US justice system to either start working for the FBI and the DOJ or spend a long, long time in prison. They decided that they would like freedom. And so they went to work and they are the ones that are responsible for figuring out how to track Bitcoin addresses globally. So there is redemption for everyone. Now, one of the things that we can talk about a little bit is how all of these American DOJ indictments tell the story of various cyber crime and various cyber criminal groups and some of the reactions that we've had. In this case, the Syrian electronic army is responsible for forcing Twitter to roll out two-factor authentication after they caused a brief stock market crash with a fraudulent tweet that came out of the Associated Press. So we can see that sometimes cyber crime has the advantage of informing us and changing our approaches and defenses against them. So a little bit about what we're working on. We're trying to figure out what malicious actors do before they perpetrate a cyber, uh, a cyber attack. And we've seen a pattern of malicious domains being registered, like Google with a zero instead of an O is a great example, right? A certificate issued to authenticate the encryption of that particular site, the creation of infrastructure, a phishing email campaign perpetrating from more of that infrastructure and victims. So what we're trying to do is figure out if we can watch and learn about how all of those indicators happen and try to help businesses avoid those type of attacks. So how do we fix the problem? Well, in the UK, there are tons of resources available headed up by the National Cyber Security Center, the CNR service, and a bunch of infrastructure um, tools, and of course, the Cybersecurity Essentials Standard, which if you follow the numbers in a peer-reviewed study indicated that about 80 to 90% of all the cyber attacks perpetrated against businesses can be mitigated almost fully by the cybersecurity essential standard. So the one takeaway from my uh, presentation today is implement cybersecurity essentials. Make sure you have a robust backup as well, daily backup. Always two backups is better than one backup. 
one to a cloud server, the other locally. And guess what? You're going to be able to help your organization survive a cyber criminal attack. There's lots of different things that you can do from putting in rules in your routers to spot very bad things from happening. Obviously, anything coming out of your network on port 445 is going to be a major problem because that's a protocol that was used in the NotPetya and the WannaCry cyber attacks. It's known as SMBV1. Very bad to have that exposed to the internet. And we can always learn more and unleash hell on the enemy by reporting email addresses and fraudulent websites to as many people as we can. And look at that website, Decent Security, go through the steps, and you can help uh, collectively as a community attack the cybercrime problem. So that's it for my presentation. Almost on time, I went a few minutes over. We are in this together, folks, and I know that sounds uh, very much like government messaging around COVID-19, uh, but when it comes to cybercrime, we have been in this for a much longer time than this pandemic, we hope. A few articles that I've written on the subject of cyber uh, threat intelligence and why it could add value. Thank you to this wonderful organization for hosting me, and I'm happy to hang out with you guys. I may even have a beverage and take some questions. So thank you so much, Ian. It has been so much insightful and I think a lot of people have a like full head because to comprehend all the knowledge which you have, it's nearly impossible. And you know, there's so much you can you can discuss and uh thank you so much much for taking us to the places where I believe that not every one of us would ever be able to do or even comprehend being that from the dark web to the national security to especially let's say the enforcement on the United States that was really interesting for me when it comes to the when it comes to the questions um, we literally answered uh, the ones which Pretty has. So if anybody yeah. else have the questions, we do have that open. Please do highlight or raise your hand, and I will um, I will let you speak if you want to. Otherwise, I just really would like to um, say thanks on the behalf of BCS and Irma Group to you, Ian, for spending time sharing the knowledge with us because I believe in information security and especially in the cyber and in those pandemic times it's important to talk about you know issues it's important about highlighting the risks which everybody can have so thank you so much um it has been very very big pleasure and honor to have you with us and that you made time for us hey you know it's it's wonderful to talk about this issue and you know for folks in audit and and resiliency it is it is incredibly tough because I think the threat landscape of a lot of businesses went up as you observed with the work from home and the isolation and not being able to lean over to a coworker to get them to double check things. I think it's really a fundamental shift in the way we work and we're just going to have to you know take the fight to the enemy uh, as best as we can. Um, you know, businesses right now are, are really are, are hurting. Some are having a really difficult time just meeting the, the financial obligations and payroll that they have right now. The last thing they need is to lose a whole bunch of money to cyber criminals. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really makes sense. And I think like, at least from my experiences, it is if there is anything busy in the area, apart the key workers in NHS and all those people, you know, making the planet work. I think the next one, and a lot of lot of times, undermined people are the ones sitting IT and making sure that you actually can work from home. And I think that in every speeches, every prices, IT people and cyber security professionals and all the people who make it secure and valuable work are often overlooked. So just wanted to say also um, thank you to you and all the guys who are still uh, on, on the line when you are IT specialists and professionals, you are also um, um, appreciated. And I have Chenuka in here that she would like to have a question. So if you don't mind, I will unmute her and we can have a discussion with her. As she thinks that, what, what do you think the importance of type physical backups and cloud setups? So I sure. will let Chanuka to talk. Chanuka, you are on, so you can have the discussion with Ian. But the question is, what do you think of importance of tape, physical backups versus cloud backups? 
Okay, you know, it's a great question. So, you know, there's not one single technology that 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 I think is out there that fulfills all of the setup. So, tape is probably still the most inexpensive way to store large data sets, okay? Um, but tape has storage costs, right? Iron Mountain can be expensive if you're sending a lot of data there. So really, there's a couple of things that you can look at. One is the data retention strategy for the organization and reduce the amount of data that you're backing up by eliminating it. Now, I know some people are like, we have to keep everything, but that's just not realistic because we're creating data at this rate that is just absolutely phenomenal. So we need to take a, a good look at what a data retention strategy is. Now, I'm a big fan of cloud-based backup, but I'm also a big fan of local backup. And I'll tell you a really interesting story about Mertsk, okay, the giant shipping company. Okay, Mertsk had no backups of their at Windows Active Directory. Okay, and I what happened? To them? I love this what? story. <laughs> you know this story? I love it. Yeah. Okay, so here's the deal: Mertsk, giant global company, they get hit by a uh, NotPetya. It knocks them and encrypts everything. They unfortunately were running a flat network. Now. Here's the deal though. There was one Active Directory controller on a saturated link in Africa, I believe, that didn't get the NotPetya bad rabbit attack on them because the link was saturated. So out of their entire infrastructure, they had one Active Directory controller that contained a replica of all of their users. And we're talking tens of thousands of users in that company, okay? Giant, giant company. Right, And of course, they had made investments like single sign-on, which means that single sign-on doesn't really work if you don't have Active Directory, yeah? So there, not only was their Active Directory completely hosed, but none of their apps would be able to work in the business because the Active Directory was hosed. You're with me so far, right? That server yeah. in Africa became the most important server in the history of the company. That server, believe it or not, was suddenly VIP'd and was rushed. I believe it was to either the UK or Norway, where the, it was the it was only, UK. It was the UK, um, yeah. and they essentially were able to restore their um, Active Directory and get their applications back online from that one box. So what do we learn from that as IT security professionals? Hey, have a server, turn it on, let it replicate, turn it off. Do that maybe once a week. And guess what? Now you have an Active Directory copy, a replica that's only maybe a few days out of date, as opposed to losing it all in a ransomware attack. So by their mistake, by that situation that Mertz shared, the CIO of Mertz got up on a stage and said, this is where we screwed up. We can all learn from that mistake and put in something as simple as an IT security shell, you know, turn on their backup server, let it replicate for, you know, five, six hours and turn it off again and do that on a weekly or monthly basis. And man, now you have some easy peasy, lemon squeezy a resilience for your organization if they get hosed by ransomware. And it's things like that that we look at and go, holy crap, it was so, it's so easy to do, but it saves such a mountain of pain. Now getting back to cloud-based backups, I think there's some really neat stuff going on. I like the idea that your cloud-based backup is several repositories where at the application layer, you're pushing from those repos to production. I like a huge separation from my dev, my prod, and my staging environments. Now, I am a firm believer that staging and dev, okay, should never have access to production data, all right? 
So what you do is you take a production database or a snapshot of the production database or an extract of that database. If you have a giant database, you anonymize it, you use it in production and staging. You have robust backups of your DVs, okay? Maybe cloud, maybe locally, maybe again, um, a server that comes on, receives the rsync backup, turns off, whatever you wanna do there, don't care. The database is super important, it's a prod database, right? What you do then is you have an exact replica of your production environment in your staging or dev environment, all right? And what you can do then very easily is if you have a un, uh, I'd say a database backup, you could restore it in an emergency into dev or staging and bring your entire infrastructure back if prod get ho gets hose banged by evil hackers. And there are some companies that I know of that are even doing this in different cloud providers. So for instance, they might be a Microsoft Azure um, production infrastructure, but they're using AWS um, Windows servers um, for their dev environment. Okay, so there you can even go crazy and go different providers in your architecture to have that huge separation. And what's really cool about that kind of separation is that you can give folks all the keys in the world to the AWS environment, but DevOps has the keys to the Azure environment. And so you can have a complete separation, but you can actually have a complete mirror of your infrastructure in two providers. And I've seen how some organizations achieve ISO 27001 by just having that complete separation of those environments. Long-winded okay. answer. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. Thanks, Suzanne. No problem. No problem. Um, so I'm just muting Chanuka back. And we have one more question from Troy Mortimer. What emerging cyber risk do you see present in renewable energy technologies? So what do you think that the cyber risk will be with you know, renewable energy, uh, energy technologies that can come up? And I will allow Troy uh, to come live as well if he wants to discuss that with you. Yeah, you know what? Troy brings up some really interesting points. And I mean, they, the, the threat landscape of renewable energy is really interesting because it relies on a whole bunch of assumptions around the integrity of things like smart meters on people's houses, but also the company structures and the company infrastructure. Now, the good news is, is that generally if you're in the renewable industry, let's, let's you know, keep fingers crossed, you're not using a whole bunch of ICS and SCADA gear that is from like the, the turn of the century. OK, so the, the, the advantage that I see for renewable energy is they're generally going to be using some new kit, not always, but generally they're going to be using some new kit. Let us hope that they're also following the best practices and not putting, you know, giant things on the Internet for people to play with. Right. There's a lot of great technology out there called data diodes used to secure ICS and SCADA environments. So that's sort of the first step. Now, where I see the businesses being the most vulnerable is in cyber uh, criminals that infiltrate and start manipulating, right, the sale cost or the transfer of money involved with the sale of energy, okay? So this is sort of like uh, cyber criminals that come to you and say, we can uh, get in front of your meter electronically so that what happens is more energy is being consumed that isn't um, identified or, um, or metered. So I see a lot of those attacks because of the complex nature of the generation to distribution piece. It's a little bit different from uh, the calculations that we use in things like power generation at a nuclear level, right? Because we pretty much know what the output is going to be. In, in, in renewables, where it's highly dependent on things like wind power, wind, uh, solar, the amount of sunshine that we're getting and things like that. Now, to equal that out and to hedge against that in the energy market is a whole next level of potential cybercrime uh, activity there with breaking into those systems that are really around the price and control. 
So if I was threat modeling renewable energy, I think I would talk a little bit about the infrastructure piece of it, but I'd really start looking at the integrity of that distribution and the pricing models that go along with it, which I know nothing about because I'm just thinking about this from a perspective of if I was attacker, how could I make the most money, right? And the only way to really achieve that in my mind is about somehow getting myself into that consumer level. So whether that, that is like getting access to people's bank accounts or the corporate accounts associated with that energy distribution platform, that would be of interest to me. But I think our, we've proven that our national grids are pretty much, pretty robust to overt sort of, I'm going to hold a nuclear power plant hostage for ransom. I don't see that as being a, a plausible threat model, um, maybe for a Hollywood movie, but not necessarily for, um, uh, uh, for uh, the national critical infrastructure. Do you have some thoughts on that, Troy? Like, do you think I'm full of shit or what? Yeah, Ian, so thanks, I appreciate that. And I, I appreciate that there's also many different um, uh, different approaches here as we kind of expand our sources of renewable energy. I guess the angle that I was coming from was on the, the wind generation side and just contemplating, yeah. you know, the the measures that are required as wind shifts and, and basically equipment's required to, you know, alter its direction and path, et cetera, in order to optimize energy generation. If someone was able to intercept that and effectively, you know, render that type of um, uh, wind generator kind of ineffective, you know, it points in the wrong direction, it shuts down when it should be going, kind yeah. of holding a country almost on hostage, either there or somehow intercepting data on the various points around usage, et cetera, and all these metrics yeah. that are flowing from the units themselves to the grid or to the, um, you know, the, the control center that, that disrupts it. So that effective decisions around feeding energy into the grid can no longer be made. So it, that's yeah. totally cool. And you know what I think we should do? So we'll get on Twitter and we'll hit up Ken Monroe and Pentest Partners and Cyber Gibbons and the rest of the crew and ask them, you know what we need at the next DEF CON? A giant wind farm and we, we need you guys to start hacking it. That would be really interesting well, that, because I know, I know nothing about the attack surface of the actual physical like windmill. I'm going to assume like you that it's got a bunch of computers in there uh, to uh, to to optimize and and maybe even an AI that learns you know exactly where the wind direction is coming from and how to optimize like the the propellers and stuff. I'd never thought that because we're putting so many of the same windmills in that the attack surface could be oh yeah you, like you send this one command and all of a sudden all of the windmills try to go backwards and you're looking at millions and millions of dollars of damage to the to those turbines very interesting to me and and i really do wonder you know uh what the level of security on that would be really cool question and threat landscape discussion oh perfect to be, to happy, to, happy to catch up offline as well yeah let's do it man that's very cool and I think, Ian, it's all across the, the, the energy or something. There are special security systems and standards across the oil and gas and all those renewable energies. I think that there are some prevention from doing that, and people do consider that. So I think it would be a great to elaborate on that more maybe on the next talks or even, as you're saying, DEFCON, let's hack the, the turbines, right? <laughs> but catch the flag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do have, I know we are running guys uh, out of the time uh, pretty much um, because we are over, but we do have one more question from uh, Naresh Shak. So he is uh, asking how the COVID is going to impact all of the security, working from home, voluntary, NHK workers, RS, and so on. So I think it's more going towards the summary. I'm going to allow Naresh to speak up if he wants to. So I will just unmute him right now. And um, yeah. If you Maris, can just welcome. Uh, oh, then here we go. Yeah, he's unmuted. So that was his question, and now she can discuss with Ian. 
Hey, Narish. Can you hear us, Narish? I might not be able to hear us. Could, so could you repeat the question for me? Sure. So how is COVID going to impact all this? And when I asked him about more elaborative on that, he said about the security, working from home, voluntary NHS mm -hmm. key workers area. So I would say that it's a summary about how all this will be impacted. Yeah, so I think mind. one of the things that IT and IT security was really comfortable with was, you know, being behind all of their fancy equipment, all of their uh, layered security. And now all of a sudden they have, you know, folks uh, at home on the same network as, a, as the refrigerator, right? Um, as all of these IoT devices, right? So one of the interesting thing is um, there's a, a website called Gray Noise that Gray Noise is essentially um, a analysis tool similar to Shodan of IP addresses that are doing crazy stuff. And Nate Warfield, who is um, one of he's one of the managers of the COVID CTI League, gave an amazing presentation. Uh, at Kaspersky SAS, um, if you can look it up and find it, I, I highly recommend it. But what he was talking about was how he could take VPN logs from uh, from all of their uh, all of their employees working at home, push them through Shodan and push them through Gray Noise, and see if there is anything crazy going on. Now, here's the here's the amazing thing about that. All of a sudden, the IT security and IT um, departments are looking after, in some cases, hundreds of branch offices that they never had responsibility for, that they're going to be using different DNS servers, they're going to be using completely different kit. So if you were a network guy that was super comfortable with stuff that runs with Nabisco, you might be having a really rough time working with a BT smart home hub, okay? So one of the big things for IT, I think, is really about um, starting to understand the diversity of equipment that's out there and providing licensing for a lot of at-home computers in terms of like uh, antivirus or EDR, uh, that's uh, the automated endpoint detection and response software and trying to make these networks uh, threat-free. And by threat-free, I mean figuring out how you can monitor your VPN traffic, push it through threat intel lists of hostile IP addresses, uh, and see if any of that is coming from any of your users. And so it's really about understanding what IT can do, what the art of the possible is, Imagining if they literally suddenly woke up and had a hundred branch offices to worry about. So it's going to take some comforting, it's going to take some tooling, it's going to take some innovation, um, and it's going to take, I think, uh, some time and effort to figure out how to scale. And I think we're going to see like the infrastructure that we've built is going to be with us for a long, long time. I think we're going to be working at working from home for a long, long time. I think we will be not traveling nearly as much as we would, because over, as I joked earlier before we went live to air, we've suddenly figured out a way to make air travel even more uncomfortable and more un, unhospitable than it was before we had COVID-19. Uh, so I think you're right in that life has changed. I think IT and IT security uh, programs and tooling uh, need to adapt. Thank you so much, Ian. No problem. Any more uh, lovely questions? They're great questions, by the way. Really great audience. Really, you know, I really appreciate the interaction. It's lovely. I think it would be better in face to face because now we would be having a beer and a wine and some sandwiches. Uh, but unfortunately, we, we don't. <laughs> I know we would. So I wanted to thank you again on the behalf of the BCS and all the uh, people who have attended for um, you spending the time going over with the time as well. So happy to have you guys. Um, I would just say again, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. 
and uh, I wish you all a good evening and I will be closing the seminar right now if there is anything else you would like to ask we will be hanging out around but I just wanted to officially close it and thank you for being with us and uh, hopefully you have enjoyed it and we always enjoy your feedback so thank you so much and see you at the next one